You've heard about some of the most famous investment frauds in history. You heard about Hegestratus' bottom reef fraud of 300 BC. You also heard about William Dewar's American bonds fraud of 1792. You heard about Emmanuel Pines' stock market fraud of 1996 and perhaps many other stock market and investment frauds even till this day. To explain why it's easy to steal money from the public through the stock market or fraudulent investment, I'd like to tell you an interesting story. It was July of 1796, Francis Cobwatt Lowell set out to become a merchant to ship goods between different countries like China, the United States, England, France, etc. But there was a problem. As a merchant who transported goods from one country to another, Lowell needed to deal with many countries. Unfortunately for him, the end of the 18th century was filled with conflicts between many nations, especially in Europe. Imagine you have to transport goods between Russia and Ukraine in April of 2022. <laughs> some of your goods might be destroyed and some of your employees might be killed in the war zone. So because of the stress Lowell went through running this risky business by 1810, his health had been damaged so his doctor advised him to take a break. Now this is where I'm going with the story. Lowell returned to the US in 1812, he then decided to start a textile company. But this time around, he wouldn't put his health at risk by being responsible for the business all by himself. Instead, he would raise most of the money he needed from the public. There was another problem. Most businesses up until this time were sole proprietorship and raising money from the public was hardly a thing. For Lowell to raise money from the public, he needed to show people that he could make them a lot of money. Um, but how would he get people to trust that he could make them money? How can I trust you? Fortunately for Lowell, there was no meaningful textile company in the US in 1812. So Lowell's unique selling promise was, since America textile is being imported from England, if you invest with me to build a big textile company, we'll make a lot of money together. People got excited and gave him a lot of money. Lowell was able to raise $400,000 and started the Boston Manufacturing Company in 1813. But like many other companies, Boston Manufacturing Company faced a lot of problems. They had problems with labor, competitors from England, and to make matters worse, Francis Lowell died on August 10, 1817. He was only 42. I didn't tell you the story of Francis Lowell's claim that he was a fraudster. He wasn't. Instead, I told you the story to show you how raising money from the public got started and the instrument that makes it work, even for the fraudsters. It is called excitement. If you can get people excited about the future, you can get money out of their pockets. It's easy for fraudsters to use these tactics because the future is mysterious. Since we are all confused about the future, a few people among us who seem more intelligent than the rest of us can claim to know the future. Even though these people are as confused as we are, since they are confident and appear to be more intelligent, we can easily believe that the new business they started will make a trillion dollars. We can easily believe that the new technology they claim to be working on will be as big as the invention of the TV. We can easily believe that our $10,000 today will soon turn into a million dollars tomorrow simply because they told us so. To make the public get excited, however, there are three simple instruments that fraudsters must have. First you need to be charismatic. Second, you have to talk a lot about the future, the problems we'll face and how your business is the solution. Scare the public if you can. It's not as though, like the, <clears throat> I mean, it's like the, the scientists all say that these bad things are gonna happen. It's like 97%. Third, use a simile to compare your abstract business idea with something they already know. So let me give you examples of how all these can play out. In the year 2008, Adam Newman and Miguel McLevy started WeWork. WeWork is an office space renting business. Call it Uber for office space. However, by January of 2019, WeWork was valued at $47 billion. Now, this meant that WeWork was more valuable than most companies in the world, including SpaceX at this time. Now, listen to this. There is a competing company in the same industry as WeWork called IWG. Comparing the two companies looks like this. Global square footage, members, locations, countries of operation, revenue, and wait for this, profit. By all comparison, IWG is a far better business than WeWork. But when it comes to evaluation, WeWork was valued at $47 billion, while IWG was valued at only $3.7 billion. The CEO of IWG, Mike Dixon, was confused and wondered, what are we missing? What are we doing wrong? And said, what are we missing? Is there something 
that we're not doing? Is there something that we're missing? Is there an ingredient that's sort of there that we are missing out on that we can add into what we're doing? That ingredient Mark Dixon was missing is called charisma. You see, when he started WeWork, Adam Newman made it a duty to go everywhere he could find cameras, charming his audience with his talk about changing the world. ...than just in your apartment. Same thing with WeWork. Even though WeWork is 50 square foot per person, a third of all WeWork spaces are actually open in open common spaces that give access to everybody that we don't measure as seats. So there's a lot more room there. It's that community being surrounded by a group of like-minded individuals, being part of something bigger than yourself, inspires people to work hard are putting in more effort and some people are putting in less and you know it's sort of a balance and I think in general the world is going to be a better place if on the one hand we can be part of a greater thing but on the other hand we can still have our own admir our own desire. The we generation in India know that the sharing economy is the future. Being part of something greater than yourself is the future. While Adam Newman was everywhere speaking charismatically about his company, the IWG CEO was busy building the company. That was a big mistake. How do I know? Even if you want to build a genuine company, as long as you need the public to invest in the company, you have to spend at least 10% of your time in front of TV cameras. Elon Musk does this so well, which is why his companies don't have a budget for advertising. Now, fraudsters take it a step further. Some of them spend 90% of their time in front of cameras. The idea is to get the public excited and make them invest in their businesses. So for example, Elizabeth Holmes was on TED Talks. I believe the individual is the answer to the challenges of healthcare. Several TV interviews. The youngest billionaire in the world. <laughs> is that heady when you hear that? You know, it's, it's not what matters. Um, what matters is how well we do in trying to make people's lives better. Many business conferences. Over the last 11 years, we've reinvented the traditional laboratory infrastructure. Countless interviews with newspapers and appearances on Billion magazine covers. Speak like a charismatic leader who is changing the world and many people will invest in your company, even though they have no idea what they're investing in. Between. Mm -hmm. What's behind your expansion? Women. <laughs> <laughs> Now, as you spend so much time in front of the cameras, in business conferences, and in TV interviews, you want to talk a lot about the future. Talk about how our present system or product is so faulty and how the future will be different and how your business is going to be the messiah that the future is looking for. Since the future is mysterious, humans naturally love to believe that charismatic people know it better than the rest of us, even though they're as confused as any one of us. If the message of the future you're preaching isn't real, Preach it repeatedly long enough and they will believe you. If the predictions you're talking about are real, then exaggerate them. This works so well for a new company, but even if your existing company is faced with too many problems, you can still use the same gimmick. Think about Facebook, right? After Zuckerberg was faced with several problems with threatening his company, he positioned the company as the hope and king of the metaverse. Why? The goal is to get the public excited so that investors will keep their money in the company. All right, perfect. Boy. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Hi. Mark. What's up, Mark? Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh huh. Who made this place? <laughs> it's awesome. Right? It's from a crater. I met an elf. Most people can't understand your abstract ideas. Another simple way to get them excited about your business is to compare your new invention with something they're familiar with. Tell people that your invisible business idea is going to end up becoming as big as Apple, Google, or even the internet. Tell them that the current stage of your business can be compared to the 1978 stage of Apple or the 1994 stage of the internet. By using the simple simile, people lose their capacity to think straight. Instead, they start ruminating on the fact that they don't want to miss the opportunity to invest in the next Microsoft, the next Google, or even the next internet. So you've lost 150 grand in one hit. Correct. Yeah, last, you know, five to 10 years. So what was the turning point? When was it that you thought to yourself, okay, I'm jumping in? I think it was just that fear of missing out, I didn't want to be left behind, that made me jump in, really. So for example, Elizabeth Holmes was on TED Talks. I believe the individual is the answer 
to the challenges of healthcare. Several TV interviews. The youngest billionaire in the world. Mm -hmm. Is that heady when you hear that? You know, it's, it's not what matters. Um, what matters is how well we do in trying to make people's lives better. Use many business conferences. Um, over the last 11 years, we've reinvented the traditional laboratory infrastructure. Countless interviews with newspapers and appearances on Billion magazine covers. For example, in the year 1982, 16-year-old Barry Minkow started a carpet cleaning company called Z-Best. At age 20, he was the boy wonder of Wall Street. Now, listen to this. Z-Best was advertised as the general mottos of carpet cleaning. Even though gullible investors have no idea how a carpet cleaning company would become as big as General Motors, they fell for his scam. When Z-Best went public in December of 1986, the company was valued at, watch this, $200 million. It was later found that Z-Best was a fraud. Another example, when Elizabeth Holmes founded Ferraris in 2003, it was compared to Apple. Was there something about the nature of what Elizabeth Holmes was hoping to do, promising to do, that attracted you to this type of investment? Was there anything altruistic uh, about it? Not for me. I was looking to make money. <laughs> but I worked for a venture capitalist at the time, and um, he said it would be equivalent to Apple uh, and to get as many shares as I could. Another example. When the Globe.com was going public in 1998, many called it the next Microsoft. Todd Kreiselman and Stefan Patino are the co-chief executive officers of the Globe.com. A simple idea? Wall Street thought it might be the next Microsoft. The Globe.com's share price was set at $9 at the start of November 13, 1998, but it closed at $63.5. The company set the world's record for IPO with a 606% increase over the initial share price. The young founders suddenly have a net worth of close to $100 million each. But in a matter of months, things started falling apart and thousands of people lost their hard-earned money. So, final example, today when people want you to invest in NFT or cryptocurrency, they tell you that it will be as big as the internet. By using the simile, it's a lot easier to make people less logical. So, in conclusion, stock market and investment frauds will live with us forever because investing is like betting on the future. Since nobody knows the future, fraudulent people can easily trick the public into believing they are creating the future while they are not. So, to protect yourself, you have to understand value investing. Value investing is a process by which an investor takes his time to understand the real value a company or invention is creating and not the hype. This often requires that you're less emotional and refuse to follow the crowd. It means you're smart enough to look beyond the charismatic speeches of the founders. It means you're smart enough to understand that none of us knows the future. It means that you're not carried away by similar tricks when people tell you, hey, this is going to be bigger than Microsoft.